Good afternoon. My name is Charles Jennings. I'm director of the Christian Regenhard Center for Emergency Response Studies. We are an applied policy research center located at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, uh, which is part of the City University of New York. Um, and uh, welcome to our December 2020 uh, seminar. These seminars originated as, as physical bricks and mortar seminars. And so uh, one of the benefits of going to the virtual platform is that we now have participants from uh, all over uh, the world. And so welcome to those uh, for you our first timers. And I see some, uh, some names of our regulars as well. Uh, today, we're very pleased to have uh, Andrew Phelps. He's Director of Emergency Management for the State of Oregon, uh, and also happens to be an, an alum of uh, John Jay College uh, uh, back in the Department of Public Management. And so uh, he's also on the advisory board for the uh, Reaganhard Center. And so he's gonna talk to us today in a really authoritative position as in his position as Director of Emergency Management about his experience and that of the state of Oregon during their historic wildfires this fall. And so uh, without further delay, I'm gonna let Andrew take it over um, and uh, talk us through his uh, slides. Uh, and then we are going to convene in an interview format and any questions you have, you can send through the chat uh, and I will uh, uh, queue those up and make sure that we get a chance to answer all of those. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Andrew. Thanks so much, Charles. Uh, glad to uh, virtually be here. Uh, I think, Charles, when, when we had spoken, gosh, in September, shortly after the fire started, and you asked me to, to speak uh, to the center and, and uh, the community, I was really excited about a trip to New York. Uh, <laughs> clearly, uh, that didn't happen. Um, I'm getting some, uh, I, I think we're co-hosting, so I'm getting some admit requests. So as they pop up, Charles, I'll just go ahead and admit folks. Hopefully it's it's no one nefarious. No, that's okay, uh, okay. Andrew, I'll, I'll manage that. So you just go All ahead right. and do your thing. I'll, I'll do the- Awesome. Uh, I'll do that, sure. Perfect, I don't wanna keep anyone in the waiting room. That can can uh, can be quite quite upsetting. Uh, yes. If you've been on the, the receiving end of, of waiting room purgatory on a Zoom call. Uh -huh. uh, again, thrilled to, to be able to, to talk a little bit about what our experience has been uh, since the Labor Day fires uh, from, from earlier this year. Um, as I was preparing this presentation, I, I realized I hadn't taken much of a breath to stop and think uh, about all we've been through here in Oregon this year. It's been one thing after another. Uh, 2020 started for us with a federal disaster declaration due to flooding in Eastern Oregon. Uh, that moved quickly into our COVID response posture. Uh, and, and just as we uh, started to feel a little bit more confident in how we were managing our COVID response and, and find a bit of a operational tempo that worked for us, uh, the state decided to, to try to burn itself down. So uh, going through these slides and, and being able to, to put these slides together. I, I'm a government employee, by the way, as I think you all know. So uh, it's it's actually uh, illegal for me to speak without PowerPoint slides to back up what it is that I'm saying. Uh, but as I was building these slides in this presentation, um, it, it, it was uh, in uh, some ways welcome, some ways unwelcome trip down memory lane. Uh, you know, uh, many of you on, on this this webinar today are responders or have a response background, and and when you're when you're always just going and and uh, dealing with the, the issue that's in front of you as a responder, uh, we don't allow a lot of time for reflection. So for me, this has been a little cathartic to build these slides and, and think through uh, what we experienced uh, in Labor Day of 2020 with our fires, uh, and now uh, at, at the three month mark. Uh, how far we've come uh, from a recovery standpoint. So with that, I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, I, I will say, Charles, if anyone has questions or anything in the comment section that you feel are, are pressing and, and uh, don't wanna wait till the more formal, I guess, Q&A after I work through my beautifully prepared PowerPoint slides, uh, feel free to interject uh, with those questions. Um, so uh, I, I wanna set the stage a little bit about what Oregon uh, is like. Uh, Growing up in the Midwest, spending most of my early adult life on the East Coast, uh, I had a view of what the Pacific Northwest was. I had never actually been to Oregon until I came out to interview for this position. Uh, and I think uh, uh, if you haven't spent a whole lot of time in the Pacific Northwest, uh, many of us have a view of what Oregon and Washington State must be like. Um, 
some of the lay of the land. Oregon's the ninth largest state in the nation, uh, just under 100,000 square miles. Uh, our population is growing. Uh, in the last 10 years, we've uh, added about uh, 600,000 folks to the state of Oregon. Uh, most of those are in the uh, I-5 corridor, which runs from Portland down to Eugene uh, on kind of the, the western side of the state. Um, and rain. Uh, Oregon, I think, is known as a rainy place and, and dreary and cloudy and everything else. Uh, little known fact, uh, that's just something we tell people who aren't from Oregon so they don't want to move here. Uh, Oregon uh, is only the 20th highest average rainfall uh, in the nation uh, average uh, among all 50 states um, at about 43.6 inches per year. Fun fact, uh, New York State is 21st, uh, getting just about half an inch less rain on average uh, than what we receive here in Oregon. So uh, while parts of Oregon, especially as you head out towards the coast on, on the western part of the state, uh, are a little bit rainier than other parts of the nation, on average, we're not that damp of a state, as it were. Um, I, I describe Oregon as a beautiful state, but a highly flammable state. Uh, and, and that's never been more true than it was this year. Um, these are scenes from Oregon. Um, about two thirds of Oregon is what can be classified as high desert. Um, high altitude, 3,000 to 4,000 feet above sea level, arid, um, not a lot grows. Uh, we've got a lot of rangeland uh, here in the state of Oregon. Uh, this image here from the Willamette National Forest along the Cascade Mountain Range is a little bit more familiar to folks when they close their eyes and think what uh, rural Oregon must look like. Um, but that's just really one part of it. And then of course, as you head out to the coast of Oregon, uh, we, we actually have some rainforest environments, uh, parts of Oregon that are, are considered rainforest. Uh, a friend of mine who works for a, a large Intel facility uh, here in, in Oregon, uh, knew he, he needed to move to this state when uh, he was visiting. And in the morning, uh, he was skiing on Mount Hood. Uh, at lunch, he went out to the Columbia River and went windsurfing on the Columbia River. And then later that afternoon was out on the Oregon coast surfing in the ocean. Um, it's a pretty, pretty amazing place to live with, with all kinds of different things happening and uh, varied terrain, geography, uh, and climate. Uh, and of course, um, beautiful downtown Portland with Mount Hood in the background. Uh, most of, of Oregon's population is centered around the Portland metro area. About uh, nearly half of our folks are, are within uh, about a, an hour or two drive uh, from the city of Portland. And look at that, Portland, it's still there. It's not on fire, no riots. How about that? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how the civil unrest in Oregon uh, impacted or didn't impact our welfare response as well. But as we look at our state, um, we do have a pretty uh, intense fire risk. Uh, I've been here in Oregon for almost six years. Every year in Oregon, we've experienced pretty severe drought. Um, as of uh, the drought monitor report that came out last week, these are weekly reports, uh, about 85% of Oregon uh, is experiencing moderate, severe, extreme, uh, or extreme drought. Um, and this is our rainy season. Uh, rains typically begin in September or October and they last through March or April. So uh, it will take uh, a pretty wet winter for us to change this drought map uh, to be something that's uh, anything other than mostly covered by some level of drought. Um, and this has been the cycle we've been in for the last uh, probably eight or 10 years. Uh, like most things uh, on the climate landscape, drought is uh, cyclic. Uh, but here in Oregon and the Pacific Northwest and, and most of the Western United States, uh, we've been in a pretty intensive period of drought. Uh, when we look at wildfires historically, uh, going back the last 20 years, uh, you, you can see it's it's a, a bit of a roller coaster in terms of the acres burned. And this is total acres uh, burned in a given wildfire year. 2012 uh, was our, our most uh, acres that have been burned to date uh, due to a wildfire. Uh, but I do wanna point out that 2012 was a little bit of an anomaly in that almost half of those acres that were burned were grasslands. Uh, Eastern Oregon, we have a lot of rangeland, grassland, and, and you can have uh, 150, 200,000 acres go up in, in a couple of days uh, without impacting homes, uh, without much of uh, firefighting activity. 
So uh, when we look at 2012, that's a little bit uh, of a different sort of a year. 2020 this year, we've burned just over a million acres. Um, some of that is national forest land. Some of it is uh, Oregon Department of Forestry or private uh, managed forest lands. Um, but really all of the forests or all the fires that have burned in 2020 were those typical wildfires as opposed to a rangeland or a grass fire. Uh, one thing that, that was I guess eye-opening for me as I moved uh, out west was the checkerboard of land ownership, um, especially out here in the west coast. Uh, you can can cross a road, and on one side of the road, it's it's a private timber company that owns that. You walk a uh, hundred yards up the road, suddenly you're in BLM-owned land. You cross the road, you're in U.S. Forest Service land, and you walk backwards another hundred yards, and now you're on uh, Oregon Department of Forestry-owned property. Uh, it's really a checkerboard of land use uh, and land ownership, and that can be uh, a little problematic when it comes to firefighting and forest management. Uh, you have different philosophies, different practices and how we manage our forest. Uh, and I think we're seeing that play out um, across the West Coast uh, with some of these severe fires. Uh, years of, of a lack of a cohesive wildfire management strategy or forest management practices uh, has caused, uh, in addition to obviously the impacts of climate change, uh, a pretty impactful environment on, on the wildfire front. Uh, this is a pretty cool little graphic that talks about uh, the Oregon Department of Forestry uh, and ODF specific owned or, or managed uh, lands. Uh, the left side of, of this chart here, as you're looking at it, goes back to uh, from 1911 to the late 30s. And we had a lot of wildfire activity. Much of that activity was actually uh, west of the Cascades out towards the coast, uh, areas that are typically a little bit rainier. Uh, but then we had this huge span between the 40s up until uh, 2012 with not a whole heck of a lot of fire activity. Things stayed, stayed pretty constant. But then as we headed into 2012, 2013, 2014, we saw an uptick in wildfire activity. And then that last uh, bar in this bar chart that you see uh, is 2020, uh, over half a million acres of, of Oregon Department of Forestry protected lands had burned. Uh, so about half of the total lands that have burned in 2020 were ODF protected lands, the other half were uh, BLM or US Forest Service lands. Uh, and then we see the trend line for, uh, that white line is the trend line for uh, uh, number of fires. So while that trend has stayed relatively constant over the course of 10 years, uh, what we try to do is obviously keep fires small and keep them from becoming conflagrations or burning into the wildland urban interface. But here in 2020, uh, that did not happen, um, at least as we moved later into the season. Whoops. So, uh, that's kind of the, the landscape that we have here in Oregon. Um, fire is nothing new for us. We experience fire every year. Uh, we share resources across uh, the West Coast uh, from a firefighting standpoint. Um, and, we, and we've learned a lot from fighting fires in other states or smaller fires here in the state of Oregon. Uh, we sent fire crews to the Tubbs Fire in Santa Rosa back in 2017. Uh, we sent uh, firefighters to the campfire, which burned Paradise, California in 2018. Um, in fact, this year we had uh, a number of crews down in California assisting with firefights, uh, and they arrived back in Oregon about three days before Labor Day. Uh, so we had a lot of crews that had been out uh, fighting fire in California uh, that were just catching up on their rest uh, when the Labor Day firestorm began to approach. So as we headed into Labor Day, uh, we had a number of fires already on the landscape. In fact, Governor Brown had declared a statewide fire emergency declaration uh, on August uh, the 19th of this year. Uh, that's typically a tool that the governor keeps in her toolbox uh, to, to do a couple of administrative things. Uh, one, it allows for us to utilize the Emergency Management Assistance Compact or EMAC, which is the nationwide mutual aid system. But then it also invokes what we call Operation Plan Smokey. This is the uh, plan that we use to mobilize the National Guard for firefighting. Uh, resources. Typically, that just entails uh, leveraging uh, rotary wing aircraft for firefighting. Uh, we've got a fleet of uh, Black Hawk helicopters that are equipped with buckets to do bucket drops. We also use our uh, dual rotor Chinook helicopters as well. 
Um, but each year over the last few years, we've trained upwards of 450 National Guard men and women to be firefighters, wildland firefighters. Uh, they get red carded, that's the wildfire credential, uh, and are available uh, when activated to assist with actual wildland firefighting operations. So when the governor does an emergency declaration for fire, those are some of the administrative things that happen. Uh, typically, we, we don't use that tool until uh, we reach a point where we're not going to have enough contract or U.S. Forest Service uh, aircraft available, and we think we're going to need those uh, National Guard helicopters to mobilize. Um, when I first came to Oregon, our state forester uh, or state uh, forestry fire protection chief, Doug Graf, uh, shared with me, uh, you know, if, if we're not burning with big fires on the landscape by August 1st, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, typically, that's held pretty true. It held true last year in 2019. It was not a very busy fire season. Uh, but unfortunately, this year, our fire season really didn't pick up in earnest until after August 1st. Uh, as we headed into the middle of August, we had a number of fires burning in the Columbia River Gorge. Uh, we had uh, a couple of fires that are burning that were burning in the Cascade Mountain Range. Uh, two of these, uh, the Lion's Head Fire and the Beachy Creek Fire, would become very problematic for us with this Labor Day wind event. Uh, in fact, the Lion's Head Fire was burning east of the Cascades, and the winds pushed it over the Cascade Mountain Range, burning closer into the Interstate 5 corridor and into Salem, uh, the state's capital. Uh, talking to our fire managers, that's not fire behavior anyone had ever seen at all in their career. So it was a pretty historic event. Uh, you can see on the slide here uh, some of the weather alerts that we were experiencing. Um, most of the state, uh, outside of the, the northeast corner of the state, were under red flag warning conditions. What this means uh, when you have red flag warnings, uh, You've got high temperatures. Uh, temperatures were forecast for Labor Day to be in the upper 80s or low 90s uh, for most of the state. You've got very low humidity. Uh, humidity readings anticipated uh, somewhere around 10 to 12 percent humidity. Uh, and then you have high winds. Those three things are really what lead to red flag warnings. On the lower right hand corner of the slide, you can see uh, what the winds were forecast to be. Uh, 41 miles an hour in Portland, 26 miles an hour in the Columbia River Gorge, and then out to the coast, 34 miles an hour in Newport. Uh, and those winds would, would be increasing throughout the evening uh, on Monday, that Labor Day. When we, when we set up for the Labor Day wind event, um, my primary concern wasn't so much fire, uh, it was the public safety power shutoffs. This is something that's come on the landscape over the last couple of years, most notably in California, where power utilities preemptively shut off power to communities where they're experiencing um, potential fire weather or those red flag alerts. We had a couple of uh, utility companies announce that they were contemplating uh, public safety power shutoffs due to uh, the severe, severe wild, uh, wildfire weather that was anticipated uh, in a couple of areas around the state, most notably the Portland metro area and out towards Mount Hood. Uh, so throughout the weekend heading into Labor Day, we had a number of coordination calls with our state partners and our local partners and the utilities to talk about timing for those public safety power shutoffs, uh, the, the scope, areas of impact, and then restoration time. So if you're going to cut off power to a city of, of 25,000 folks, uh, once the winds have calmed, once the fire weather has eased, how quickly can that power be brought back up? And then also some of the consequence management of a, of a large scale planned power outage. Uh, if a fire does spark and you've got a power outage, what does that do for your alert notification, your evacuations? If you don't have control over stoplights because the power's out, um, that can be really problematic when you're trying to evacuate community. So these were all things that we were talking about as an emergency management community heading into the wind event on Labor Day. Uh, I mentioned our calls with our, our local partners and our state partners. Uh, I will note that many communities began to issue pre-evacuation notices for wildfire. These were for fires that hadn't even started yet. But just to put their communities on notice, hey, this is a, an abnormal event. Uh, we're going to experience high winds, uh, fires could start quickly, and they could move even quicker. Uh, so we wanted our communities to be on alert. Uh, here in Oregon, that's a local uh, action. Uh, local authorities, the county sheriffs typically, uh, have responsibility for evacuating their communities. So we relied really heavily on our county sheriff's offices and local emergency managers to make those decisions to notify their communities about uh, pre-evacuation notices. 
we also have uh, a tiered evacuation system here in Oregon, uh, level one, level two, level three. Uh, level one evacuation means uh, get ready, that, that uh, conditions are favorable for uh, an event to occur that could cause you to leave your home. Start thinking about your evacuation routes, where you'll go and the things that you'll need to take with you when you evacuate. Get set is level two. That means, okay, something has happened that may now uh, uh, force you from your home. If you haven't already loaded your vehicle with your evacuation supplies, do it now. For me personally, as an emergency manager, if I'm on level two evacuation notices, that's get out. Uh, I don't want to wait till a level three. Level three means go. When you get a level three evacuation notice, uh, your time to prepare is over. You need to leave your home with whatever it is you've got uh, on your back, in your pockets, or in your vehicle. Um, so we had a number of communities that were in that level one evacuation uh, get ready posture, uh, which was uh, Something we don't see very often here in Oregon, um, but something, uh, especially when there's not already a fire burning uh, on the landscape, uh, as was the case for many of the folks that, that received those level one evacuation notices, um, but something that ultimately proved, I think, uh, to be a lifesaver. So September 7th, uh, this was Labor Day. Um, this is what we woke up to uh, on the news. Uh, the the uh, Storm Prediction Center of the National Weather Service uh, was showing a uh, really high fire danger in the Portland metro area all the way down to Salem and through the Cascade Mountain Range. Uh, we were looking at some fires that were currently burning on that landscape. I mentioned the Lion's Head fire uh, that was on the other side of the Cascades. If you look at that image on the left-hand side of the slides, you can see where it turns from sort of yellow to green, and then there's that that pink color of, of the lion's head fire. That dividing line really is sort of the center of the Cascades. So it was burning east of the Cascades and ultimately the winds uh, coming out of the east would push that fire uh, over the Cascade Crest and into uh, some canyons that were heading down towards the city of Salem and much more urban and populated areas. And I mentioned previously too, the uh, fire weather warnings, uh, red flag warnings throughout much of the state. Um, this was a, a very rare event. Uh, we get 70 mile an hour winds here in Oregon uh, on, the, on the East Coast, I think you call them hurricanes. Uh, when we get 70 mile an hour winds in, in Oregon, we call that November. Um, it's pretty typical uh, in November and December to have those types of winds, uh, but typically they're accompanied by rain or it's been raining for a while before those winds come and we don't have the, the, the fire issues. Uh, these winds were really much more like the Santa Ana winds that they deal with in California, winds that are dry coming out of the east um, and, and really create a blowtorch effect when they start getting into fire. So, uh, the winds began to pick up in the afternoon of September 7th uh, and about four or five o'clock I started having um, hourly phone calls with our state forester uh, for fire protection with our state fire marshal. Uh, here in Oregon the state fire marshal is a little bit unique. Uh, they manage the state fire mobilization plan. Uh, this is a series of firefighting task forces made up of uh, five engines and staff uh, from local fire departments that can be deployed anywhere in the state at a moment's notice uh, to fight um, generally what are urban interface, wildland urban interface fires. They don't do the direct wildfire fighting, but they do structural protection. Uh, and when homes become in, involved in fire, uh, they support the local fire departments in fighting those fires and trying to protect uh, property. Um, so that's the, the state fire marshal's office role. Uh, and heading into this, they had a number of task forces on standby to mobilize wherever they were needed. This is kind of one of the challenges with a, a, a statewide fire weather event like this. Um, when, when we talk about hurricane response, you have that, that cone of uncertainty and those spaghetti models that show where a hurricane may hit. Uh, for fires, it's, it's much more difficult to figure out where to prioritize or uh, stage resources to be useful for a potential fire that may, out, may, may uh, break out. Uh, we don't know where they're going to hit. Um, I will say that the, the utilities that had public safety power shutoffs, those were very, very effective. We did not have fires start in those areas where power had shut off. Um, a lot of the, the, the analysis and investigation is, is ongoing about cause and origin of some of these fires, uh, but all indications are that some of the fires, many of the fires were, were started by down power lines, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in, in just a few slides here. 
So as we headed into that evening uh, of September 7th, uh, again, from an emergency management standpoint, we were worried about the consequences of the winds, uh, additional power shutoffs, power outages due to down power lines. Um, and I have a high level, I still have a high level of confidence in our firefighters' ability to fight fire. It's what they do, they're really good at it. And uh, from, a, from an emergency management standpoint and a tactical standpoint, I don't get involved in those conversations about uh, uh, where we're gonna be deploying hand crews or where our uh, fixed wing aircraft are gonna be doing retardant drops or where we're gonna send a structural firefighting task force. Uh, our firefighters are professionals. Uh, they've got their system dialed in and they're really, really good at it. So that allows me as an emergency manager to think about the, the power outage issues, if we need to evacuate, where we're gonna do our sheltering operations, who's gonna support sheltering operations, uh, and some of those secondary or tertiary issues to the firefight um, that our firefighters don't wanna worry about while they're fighting fires, we as emergency managers can take on some of that burden. Uh, about 10 o'clock at night, uh, the, the frequency of the calls, the urgency of the calls, uh, and the gravity of the calls began to change a little bit. Uh, we began getting requests uh, to approve fire management assistance grants, FMAGs, uh, and these are FEMA grants that are typically only requested and approved when you have fires burning into the wildland urban interface. Uh, in Oregon, the Department of Forestry maintains uh, the governor's authorized representative status to request those uh, fire management assistance grants. A little bit unusual, and in, in, in most other states, it's the emergency management agency that makes those requests. Uh, very often, I'll get a courtesy call from our state forester saying, hey, we're gonna make a request for an FMAG, uh, and then FEMA, once they receive the request, will actually notify me that the request has been approved, and then I'll notify the state forestry. Uh, about three hours into, uh, after 11, 10 o'clock on uh, September 7th at Labor Day evening, uh, the rate at which we were requesting fire management assistance grants uh, outpaced my situational awareness. I was getting notified by FEMA of fire management assistance grant approvals for fires I didn't even know had started. That's how quickly uh, things were evolving and quite frankly, how um, inundated with activity our state forester was uh, and our state fire marshal. Uh, that for me was an indication that this was gonna be a really rough 24, 48 or 72 hours. Um, so a lot of coordination calls that evening, uh, didn't get a whole heck of a lot of sleep. Again, going through my, my call logs, uh, thinking about this presentation and preparing my presentation, I went back and I looked at my call records for uh, the 7th of September and into the morning of the 8th. Um, and between 10 o'clock at night and six o'clock in the morning, uh, I was on the phone at least every 20 minutes talking to either the state fire marshal's office, our FEMA regional administrator, the state forester, uh, my duty officer, or our public information staff to get out uh, messaging on social media and assist our locals with alert and warning messaging. Um, what really got my attention, uh, as if all of this wasn't enough to get my attention, uh, was the call that I got from our state fire marshal asking for a point of contact for one of the utility companies. Um, this is typically a request that would go to the local emergency manager or they'd have a direct contact with the local utilities on site. Uh, what you're seeing here on the screen uh, is what remained of a command post uh, that the state fire marshal's office had set up to fight the Beachy Creek fire. Um, at about one o'clock in the morning, we were told that lines were down and arcing. Uh, and they needed contact for a utility company to shut off those lines. They couldn't reach anybody. So we began trying to contact utilities and about five minutes later, uh, I got another call from the fire marshal uh, that the command post was engulfed uh, and they were evacuating the command post. I've been doing this work for a long time. Um, some of you may know uh, my entrance into emergency management came while living in, in New York City and, and experiencing the events of September 11th. Uh, at that time, uh, I was working in New York as an actor. Uh, actually, that's a lie. Uh, I was working in New York as an auditioner. I wasn't doing much acting. Uh, but at that point, I had never even taken a first aid class or anything, didn't know anything about emergencies, disasters, or any, any, any of, of, 
of those issues. Um, but my experience on September 11th uh, changed that for me and, and made me a student of emergency management disaster response. Uh, and I think like many of us, I, I felt this, uh, this, this pull uh, to try to prevent bad things from happening in the future. Uh, and, and this sense of helplessness of watching what was unfolding about 20 blocks from my apartment uh, where I lived in the East Village uh, and, and the feeling of helplessness, not being able to do anything. Um, in, in my career, I've generally felt like I can do something to, to help whatever the bad situation is. Uh, but when I got that call from the state fire marshal that their command post was engulfed, that they were evacuating, um, I was instantly transported back uh, almost 19 years to the day to 9-11 uh, and hearing the reports of, of of the command post that had been set up at the World Trade Center and uh, the devastation that followed. And then that familiar feeling of helplessness. Uh, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot any of us could do uh, once, once the command post was engulfed, um, only to try to get information out to folks uh, and stay in contact with our state fire marshal office uh, partners. Uh, and keep our fingers crossed that uh, not only the citizens that were being impacted, but our firefighters uh, would be able to make it through a smoke-filled, flaming, twisty, turny canyon along a river uh, in the dead of night and make it to safety. So uh, as, as September 7th turned into September 8th, uh, the state was literally on fire. Uh, on the side of the slide here, you can see uh, kind of a snapshot of where many of the larger fires burned. Uh, for context, that Alameda Drive fire on the, the bottom half of the, of the image up to the Fruit Valley and Big Hollow fire, uh, that's the southern and the northern border of the state of Oregon. It's about 340, 350 miles. Uh, and we had fire pretty much up and down uh, that Interstate 5 corridor. Uh, the tan line that you see just to the left there of, of those fire indicators, that's Interstate 5. Uh, an incredible amount of fire uh, burning in places where we don't normally see fire, uh, definitely in that wildland urban interface, uh, and all of them moving incredibly, incredibly quickly, being driven by 40, 50, 60 mile an hour winds coming out of the east and pushing these fires directly into uh, not just populated areas, but in, in many cases, urban centers. Um, I'm, highlight I'm highlighting a couple of fires here, uh, five fires actually, that we'll do a bit of a deeper dive into. The Lion's Head Fire and the Beachy Creek Fire. These were two fires that were already burning on the landscape. They started on August 16th. Uh, a couple of other fires, the Holiday Farm Fire, the Riverside Fire, and the Almeda Fire started uh, during this windstorm. I will note that the Almeda fire, the Almeda Drive fire, which burned in uh, Jackson County, uh, was determined to be arson or suspected arson. Uh, an individual was arrested about two days after that fire started and charged with setting that fire. Uh, the rest of them though, uh, were believed to be caused uh, by other means. A human caused, there wasn't lightning associated with this windstorm. Uh, so one can infer that uh, utilities or electrical uh, ignition uh, is what led to many of these fires. Um, all told, we had about 25 large fires burning on the landscape. Uh, this included uh, fires out on the Oregon coast, uh, all up and down the Interstate 5 corridor, and a couple of fires that were burning more in the eastern portion of the state, uh, but didn't require the level of resourcing due to their lack of impact for uh, or life safety concerns that we had. Um, I mentioned the state fire marshal's office. Uh, mobilizes our task forces. We can typically support two, maybe three large fires with our task force mobilization plan. Uh, as we turned into the morning of September 8th, uh, we were out of task forces. There were no resources for the state to send anywhere. Uh, California was burning quite a bit. Washington State was burning quite a bit. Uh, we were really, really nervous about our lack of structural firefighting resources. And the last big fire to take off was at Alameda Drive fire, which we'll talk about in a few slides as well. Uh, 
and that was a fire where we ended up having to pull task forces that weren't formal task forces, uh, but task forces that were created on the fly, uh, primarily out of the Portland metro area, and drive them the five hours from Portland uh, down to Medford and Ashland, Oregon to assist uh, with uh, not even the firefight, with evacuations. Uh, the fires were moving so quickly, very often we had to make decisions, the firefighters had to make decisions to take a stand uh, after knowing uh, many, many homes would be destroyed. Uh, there were just uh, not a lot of safe places where these firefighters could set up uh, an anchor, if you will, uh, to get their arms around those fires and, and do more structure protection. I will note uh, that with all of these fires burning, the last of these fires, the Riverside Fire, which was just outside of the Portland metro area, was finally determined to be contained on December 3rd, almost three months after it started. Uh, these firefighting operations are incredibly complex. Uh, they burn in landscape uh, that is hard to access. Uh, and very often you'll have fire burning underground in the root balls of trees. Uh, so I, I fully expect in the spring after we, we head out of the, the winter uh, rainy months uh, to do IR flights, infrared flights uh, over some of these fire scars and identify spots uh, that are still hot uh, where we'll need to send hand crews in to go and dig up stumps and, and continue to put out some of these fires. But all fires have now been contained, the last of which uh, the Riverside Fire was contained uh, about five days ago. So here's a, uh, another map of the state to sort of show the impacts of some of these fires. You've got the fire uh, perimeter maps shown here. Uh, those are the, the kind of bright red colors that are outlined. Then you have the evacuation levels. Um, this is a tremendous amount of area. Uh, tens of thousands of square miles were under some level of evacuation notice. I mentioned uh, over a million acres were burned this year in Oregon. Uh, I want to call your attention specifically to the upper portion of the screen in the center there where it says Riverside and Beachy Creek. Uh, the county that you see uh, surrounding Riverside fire, that entire county, Clackamas County, was under some level of evacuation order. Uh, I've never seen that at all in my career. Um, I'll be perfectly content if I go the remainder of my career without seeing something like that again. Uh, but this really shows uh, the scope of these fires. Uh, the fire footprint of, of the Beachy Creek fire and the Riverside fire is about the size of Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts. Um, so. Uh, Sometimes it's hard, I think, when we live on the East Coast uh, to picture uh, the vastness of, of the Western landscape, especially when you have fires burning. Uh, but it gets pretty, pretty uh, incredible uh, to, to then, after these fires are contained, to drive through some of these burn scars. Uh, and you can be driving for an hour uh, up a highway and still be in the burn scar for some of these fires. Uh, but we literally had fire uh, in just about every county in the state of Oregon. Um, at some point during this Labor Day weekend. Uh, many of them weren't burning into the wild and urban inter interface. They weren't impacting homes or structures or people, uh, but many of them were. So here's some, some of what we saw. This is a view of Interstate 5, just north of Salem, uh, where I'm sitting today. Visibility was only a couple hundred yards and, and this air quality lasted for uh, about 10 days after these fires started. Here's a satellite image to show uh, the smoke coverage. Again, you, you can tell that the wind is coming from the east, which is fairly abnormal for Oregon in the summertime. Usually our east winds start in uh, November or December, uh, but most of the state was blanketed. Uh, about the, the left third of the screen uh, is the coast and, and the ocean. Um, so that middle third of the screen is, is the most populated place of our state. And we were just socked in with this dense wildfire smoke and ash for, uh, like I said, about a, a week to 10 days. Air quality became a pretty big concern. Uh, you can see some of these air quality numbers off the charts. Um, again, the, the entire state of Oregon had some level of air quality impacts. Uh, places like Portland with 500 parts per million of, of ash and, and other gunk uh, in the air made it the most hazardous uh, air anywhere on the planet. Um, and it stayed that way for a number of days until we had uh, some clearing uh, in the forecast and the wind shifted from uh, an easterly wind to a western wind. If we could, I'd like to dive into a couple of the, the more significant fires 
that we dealt with. Um, the first I'll share is the Lion's Head Beachy Creek fire. These are the fires that, that were already burning when the wind event uh, began. Uh, they combined as two fires, so, so a complex fire on September 8th, the day after the windstorm, fight, uh, windstorm started, uh, and combined to burn over 400,000 acres. Uh, this is one of the largest fires once combined uh, in the state of Oregon's history. This fire burned into two counties, Marion County and Lynn County, uh, and destroyed over 700 homes. Uh, we did have five fatalities associated with this fire, um, but tremendous stories of uh, heroism and uh, innovation that saved folks' lives. Uh, this fire burned down a canyon uh, along the uh, Santiam River. Uh, and there were at least uh, three stories that I heard of folks whose homes uh, were on fire, they couldn't escape, uh, trees were coming down on the roads, and folks jumped into the Santiam River uh, and stayed there for up to 24 hours uh, while the fire was burning around them. Uh, pretty incredible. Um, this is one of those areas that has one way in, one way out. It's a very narrow two-lane highway through mountainous terrain. Uh, during a good day, it's a difficult drive. It's a beautiful drive, but it's a difficult drive. Uh, as quickly as these fires moved, the fact that we didn't have dozens, if not hundreds of folks trapped on a burning highway blows my mind. I don't know how we did not lose more folks uh, in this particular fire. Uh, the five fatalities uh, were certainly tragic. Um, uh, we had one family uh, who lost a, a, a child uh, who was with his grandmother. Um, and, and those stories are, are uh, always difficult um, to hear. Uh, if, you, if you have children, if you were a child, uh, you can just imagine what these folks were going through being surrounded in this inferno. Um, and, and it's it's absolutely devastating to, to know what these folks were experiencing. We had another person pass away in the fire uh, who was someone that I would describe as the Lorax, if you remember that Dr. Seuss story. He was the person who spoke for the trees, a tremendous advocate for, uh, for, for forestry protection, uh, for, for wildland management uh, and timber management, uh, and someone who lived way up in the woods uh, and was not able to evacuate uh, and unfortunately lost their lives in the fire. Um, I, I mentioned Oregon's a, a large state geographically, but uh, when it comes to the people, we're a pretty small state, about 4 million folks. Uh, it seems everyone knows somebody who was impacted by the fires. Either they were evacuated, they lost their home, uh, or they lost a loved one. Um, this fire in particular, the Lion's Head and Beachy Creek, because it burned so close to the capital, we had a lot of state employees who were impacted by this fire, who had to evacuate, who lost homes. And in fact, one of our state senators, his home uh, burned in this fire as well, Senator Gerard. Uh, I, I will say from a recovery standpoint, uh, when you're dealing with legislators who've lost their home, uh, it does make for some fascinating conversations from a policy standpoint about how we move forward uh, from these difficult fire seasons. Uh, this is uh, a view from inside the Capitol. On the 8th of September, we were doing press briefings with the governor. Uh, I stepped out of the press briefing, and this was the view looking out of the, the from the rotunda of the Capitol, uh, and this this orange haze uh, from, from the wildfire and the smoke uh, that was beginning to impact Salem. I want to share this video. As I got to my car on the 8th after leaving uh, the press conference, this is what I discovered uh, on my car here. Hopefully the video will work. Uh, you can still see some of the ash blowing in the air. Uh, and this kept up for about uh, three days in the, in the Salem area. Uh, you could watch ash fall from the sky just like it was snow. That same day, the 8th, this is the view of the Capitol. Uh, no filter, no Photoshop. Uh, this is what it looked like, a, a Martian landscape. Um, as an emergency manager, I don't normally find myself uh, in situations where I'm fearful. Uh, we tend to be tucked away in, in emergency coordination centers or emergency operation centers with plenty of coffee and snacks and and well away or uh, well away physically from from whatever bad day is happening. Um, 
but coming out of that press conference at the Capitol, seeing what the sky looked like, uh, quite frankly, not being able to breathe too well, uh, was one of the few times in my career uh, as an emergency manager, I've been, a, I've been a little afraid for what was happening around me and to my communities. Uh, the Holiday Farm Fire uh, is the next fire that I want to call attention to. This fire actually began on the 7th with the windstorm. Uh, it burned, uh, oh, I, I do want to go back real quick here and talk about the, uh, the, the Lionhead Beachy Creek now that I see the other slide. Uh, it, it did burn uh, the Lionhead Beachy Creek fire about 15, within 15 miles of the state's emergency coordination center. So uh, I, I mentioned the, the anxiety and the fear that I had uh, as, as the winds were pushing these, this fire closer to Salem. Um, and that evening we began to have conversations about where we would relocate the state ECC if we had to evacuate. Fortunately, it didn't come to that. Uh, Fortunately or unfortunately due to COVID, we've had a lot of conversations this year about continuity of operations planning and uh, how to work from alternate work sites. Uh, so I, I feel like we would have been very prepared to do that if we needed to. Uh, the one negative is that our alternate site that's been designated is actually closer to where the Lions Head and Beachy Creek fire uh, had burned. So we probably would have located uh, someplace closer to the coast uh, with one of our local emergency managers from our coastal communities. Uh, but fortunately it didn't come to that, but, but we were making preparations to evacuate the state ECC uh, if we needed to. And that was uh, an incredibly uh, sobering conversation to have. The Holiday Farm Fire, this burned in Lane County, uh, 173,000 acres destroying uh, over 450 homes. We did have one fatality associated with this fire uh, and it burned within about 16 miles of the University of Oregon campus in Eugene, Oregon. This fire like the Beachy Creek fire burned up into a watershed. So we're gonna have long-term ongoing issues with water quality, uh, erosion, uh, soil runoff, et cetera as well as the environmental impacts of ash and debris coming into our waterways. Um, this is gonna make for a, an incredibly challenging recovery as well. Many of these sites up, up these canyons are difficult to access with heavy equipment. Uh, and we've got a lot of work to do to clear out uh, the debris that was left behind by these fires. Um, but uh, just, just incredible intensity. This is a fire, uh, a shot from the Holiday Farm fire in Lane County. Uh, one of the 463 homes that were destroyed. Uh, as a firefighter, I, I, I spent some time fighting fire back in New York. Uh, and I always uh, scratch my head wondering how you, how you can let homes burn. Um, seeing how, how quickly fire moved uh, through these canyons, uh, again, that blowtorch effect with 40, 50, 60 mile an hour winds, uh, there was just, nothing to be done for many of these homes. Uh, I was able to do a bit of an overflight of, of some of the fire scar uh, area. And I will say mitigation, hazard mitigation makes a difference. Fuel thinning, defensible space in particular makes a difference. And as we would fly over some of these communities, uh, there would be homes that were standing, um, not because of anything the firefighters did necessarily, uh, but because of the defensible space that had built, been built in around these homes uh, and the fire resistant materials that have been used to build those homes. Metal roofs, uh, clearing uh, uh, trees and brush and shrubs and everything else from within 100 feet of those homes. Those made difference uh, differences, even in, in a firestorm like this with uh, incredible winds, uh, an incredible fuel load in and around many of these homes. Uh, I, I, uh, as we work on the after action, I, I think one of those recommendations is going to be, uh, I would hope, something around land use and building codes and the way we uh, uh, are more thoughtful about not just how we build, but where we build. Uh, more scenes from the uh, Holiday Farm fire. When I saw this picture, I thought it was a, a, a volcano in Hawaii or something, just absolutely incredible. And, and, and how quickly these fires would move over uh, hilltops and mountaintops, uh, just, just very little uh, was able to, to, to slow down uh, these fires. And we were really, uh, in many ways, waiting for uh, winds to die down and the weather to change a little bit. Uh, the Riverside Fire, this was the fire that was burning most closely to Portland and the Portland metro area. This is the fire that caused uh, all of Clackamas County, about 400,000 people to be under some level of an evacuation notice. This fire also began on that Tuesday, the day after Labor Day, September the 8th. 
uh, burned 138,000 acres and destroyed 62 homes. Remarkably, there were no fatalities associated with this fire, which is the one silver lining, but it did get within about 10 or 12 miles of uh, the Portland metro area, so where we have uh, heavy residential apartment homes, heavy uh, uh, commercial use uh, areas. Uh, it's kind of that spot uh, in the Portland metro area where you, you don't know if you're still in Portland or one of the neighboring towns. It's just that 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 Portland metro area, uh, and uh, we've never seen fire come that close uh, to, to burning into the city of Portland before. And I, I note just personally, it was 18 miles uh, from my home uh, where the fire finally uh, was contained uh, and stopped burning towards the city of Portland. Um, but for four days, my family was under uh, an evacuation notice. Uh, uh, you like to think you're prepared as an emergency manager, uh, but boy, you really start wondering, gosh, do we have everything we need if we have to go quickly, especially when I'm at work? Uh, is my family gonna, gonna be able to know what to do and where to go? Uh, and, and to focus in that environment can certainly be challenging. Um, but uh, fortunately we didn't have to evacuate. We remained under the level one notice at our home, uh, but we had a lot of friends and neighbors uh, who were forced to evacuate. Um, I'll also note that this fire was about two miles away from combining with the Beachy Creek and the Lion's Head fire. Uh, that was very concerning due to the increase in fire behavior that that would have created to have those two really large fires merge. Um, I, I do think that we would have been talking about evacuating parts of Salem, Oregon, the state's capital, had those fires merged uh, with the increased winds that that would have created uh, and the, the additional challenges it would have, it would have uh, caused with just managing the response to instead of one 400,000 acre fire and 130,000 acre fire to really a 600,000 acre fire, uh, managing that uh, and, and the challenges would have been uh, a game changer, I think, and not in a good way for us. Here's the uh, the header of the fire uh, for the Riverside Fire. Again, this is just a few miles outside of uh, uh, the Portland metro area. Um, waking up in the morning and seeing something like that is 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 not a good feeling at all. Uh, the original title of this next slide was Bad to Worse, and it didn't seem to capture really what we experienced at the Alameda Drive fire. So I changed it to Bad to Catastrophic. Uh, this was the fire. Um, I, I was worried, I was anxious, I was sad about the other fires. This was the fire that made me sick to my stomach. Um, this was the fire that when I got a call on the evening of the 8th from the county emergency manager in Jackson County, who told us they needed uh, between 200 and 300 body bags uh, for the number of fatalities they were anticipating. Um, when I talked to a Portland firefighter who's a good friend of mine who was deployed down to the Alameda fire and, and made that five hour drive uh, in his fire engine and told me that he would knock on one door, someone would open the door and say they were getting ready to evacuate he would go to the next house, knock on that door, look to his left at the door of the house that he just knocked on and that house was engulfed in flames and he didn't see anyone leave. Um, that's where I think I and a lot of my team um, started to have kind of a tough time. Uh, we've had experiences talking to our friends in California about the Paradise Fire, the Tubbs Fire, where we've had uh, a large number of fatalities. I don't want to say we didn't think we could experience that in Oregon. Uh, as an emergency manager, you should probably find a different job if you don't think bad things can happen to your community. Uh, but I guess we had hoped uh, that we would avoid those types of situations. Everything that was coming out of the Alameda, fire, uh, Alameda Drive fire in Jackson County uh, was signaling utter devastation. Um, entire mobile home parks with 150 mobile homes going up like a match uh, with no warning or no notice. Again, this was a fire that uh, is believed to have been intentionally started. These are communities uh, in rural agricultural Oregon, most of whom don't speak English. Uh, they're uh, agricultural workers, uh, large families living in small homes. Um, the potential loss of life was 
extraordinary. Um, all told, we only burned 3,200 acres with this fire, so it was a relatively small fire. But when I toured the fire uh, in Jackson County, the Alameda Drive fire, this did not seem like a wildfire. This was an urban conflagration that burned a couple of trees, is, is the way I described it. Uh, we lost over 2,300 homes, uh, hundreds of commercial structures, restaurants, grocery stores, banks. 80% uh, of the community was destroyed by fire. And this, these, are, these are two cities, uh, the city of Talent and the city of Phoenix, that have about 11,000 residents. Again, mostly agricultural workers, lower income folks, uh, folks that could least afford to lose everything, lost everything. We also had two fire stations destroyed, uh, damaged or destroyed uh, in the Alameda Drive fire. Uh, and and, and this, these are small towns. Uh, they don't have the resources uh, to fight a fire like this. I, I mentioned those task forces that came in from other parts of the state. Uh, those were absolutely necessary um, to assist these communities with, with this firefight. Uh, speaking to the governor uh, after this fire and she said andrew how do we how do we resource these communities to fight fires like this and i said governor you don't you, you can't create an fdny for the city of talent oregon in anticipation of an urban conflagration like this where we need to focus is on uh reducing our risk reducing our exposure educating folks about hazards, getting folks to sign up for mass notification systems, using the tools that we have in our toolbox to alert folks of impending fires or evacuations, uh, building in more defensible space into our communities, thinking about how we uh, plan for egress of mobile home parks or uh, apartment complexes. Uh, you can't prevent or eliminate, I guess, every hazard, but I truly think we can prevent most hazards from becoming disasters. And it's not always through response. I think it's what we do uh, before we have our bad day that's going to make the most difference uh, for fires. Um, I'll also note uh, the three fatalities. That was a number that I, I still look at and kind of shake my head. And, and I'm waiting for more information now, three months later. How, how, did, how did we miss... Um, what surely had to have been more than three fatalities with a fire like this. Again, talking to the emergency manager down there, two to 300 fatalities is what they were anticipating. Talking to the firefighters who saw people in a home one minute, didn't see anyone evacuate, the next minute turned around and the home was engulfed in flames. Uh, the fact that so many folks got out uh, was just remarkable. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the urban search and rescue mission uh, to do remains detection and recovery uh, and what that experience was like as well, uh, primarily on this particular fire. Um, but this is the community I think that's going to have obviously the longest road ahead for recovery. Uh, I mentioned uh, the seasonal agricultural workers who made up a lot of the population. Those folks may not stick around. Many of them have not stuck around. So how do you rebuild a community that lost 80% of its housing stock? its industry and, and commercial enterprise, and 40 or 50% of the population leaves. What happens to those communities? Um, it's a policy issue, it's a funding issue, it's an equity issue. Uh, and these are all things that we're struggling with here in Oregon as we continue to work towards recovery. This is a map of the Alameda Drive fire. Uh, as you see on the bottom part of the screen, the city of Ashland, uh, home of the famous Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And then up north, Medford, a city of about 70 or 80,000 folks. Uh, this fire started just north of Ashland and literally burned up the I-5 corridor in Greenway, uh, destroying darn near everything in its path. Again, 2,300 acres, uh, but just absolutely devastating in, in terms of the areas uh, that were impacted by this fire. This is an evening view of the evening of the 8th of the Alameda Drive fire. Um, this isn't the middle of the woods. This isn't uh, a scenic national forest. This is a community. This is where people live um, and, and where thousands of folks have now been displaced. This is a view of one of the mobile home communities uh, from Talent, Oregon. This was something else that I'd never seen before. Uh, the red stuff you see, that's the fire retardant that gets dropped from those large uh, air tankers that fly over wildfires. I've never seen retardant intentionally dropped uh, on a housing development before, ever. Uh, 
and, and, and you see this trail of red up and down the burn scar uh, for this fire. Um, again, looking at some of what burned, uh, there's a couple of buildings there that survived. Don't know why, maybe it was the building materials, maybe it was where the wind shifted. Um, but you had an incredible amount of devastation uh, and to drive through these communities, you can't look anywhere without seeing um, what's left of, of burned out mobile homes, uh, apartment complexes and other single family structures primarily. So I'll, I'll close with an overview of the response. Um, I wanna talk briefly about the firefight. Uh, at one point in Oregon, we had over 6,000 firefighters uh, in Oregon fighting fire. Uh, an awesome view on the upper right-hand corner of one of our Black Hawk helicopters uh, doing uh, aerial drops uh, to assist with fire. And boy, if you've ever seen a, a, a Black Hawk with 4,000 gallons of water in a bucket, dropping water on, on 400,000 acres of, of burning forest. Uh, it seems in some ways like an exercise in futility, uh, but I will say all of those resources helped out quite a bit. Uh, we had resources from nearly every state in the nation here in Oregon, uh, either coordinated on the wildland side through the National uh, Fire Inter uh, National Interagency Fire Center or through EMAC, the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. Uh, we did have one aviator from Montana uh, who died uh, during the White River Fire in August, August 19th, I believe was the day of his crash and, and when he passed away. Um, but amazingly, we didn't have a single firefighter fatality associated with uh, Labor Day fires. Um, that was another thing I think that we were gearing up for in addition to the, to the mass fatalities we were expecting due to the Alameda fire and, and some of the other fires burning in difficult to evacuate locations. Um, we didn't lose a single firefighter and, and we're, we're really grateful for that. Uh, we did lose the Oregon Department of Forestry District Headquarters in the Beachy Creek Fire, a beautiful, beautiful old building from the 1920s, burned to the ground. Uh, uh, but again, no loss of life there. Uh, and, and one thing that we don't talk about very often that I, I want to make sure that this group here is, uh, is the importance of private industry firefighters. Uh, we have a lot of timber land in Oregon, a lot of timber industry in Oregon, and most of those timber companies maintain uh, as part of their operation, fire crews. These are folks that are normally out there cutting down trees and logging, uh, but they're also trained as firefighters. Having their resources and their equipment essentially pre-positioned in the areas where they were working allowed us to get much more of a jump on many of the smaller fires that started. Uh, and I think ultimately made a huge difference in, in taking what was a, an awful day, an awful couple of days, uh, could have been made a heck of a lot worse if we didn't have those private contract firefighting resources who know their jobs, who know their land, who know their equipment, and more importantly, know how to plug into the official firefighting response. On the uh, federal integration side, uh, we don't have a lot of disasters here in Oregon where the feds show up while we're actively doing disaster response. That was different with this. Uh, we made an emergency declaration request to the president on September 10th. And on September 13th, we made a disaster, a major disaster declaration request for 20 counties for public assistance and eight counties for individual assistance. Uh, correction, we, we made that request on the 12th and it was approved on the 13th. Uh, typically uh, in my career, I've, I've now I've uh, been the uh, governor's authorized representative and state coordinating officer for eight federally declared disasters in the state of Oregon. I don't know that I've ever had one approved in less than a month. Uh, to get one turned around in 24 hours was absolutely remarkable and really speaks to the partnerships that we in Oregon have with our federal colleagues, both uh, our regional FEMA administrator, Michael O'Hare, uh, and the FEMA administrator back at headquarters, uh, Pete Gaynor two folks who are former state emergency management directors who I've worked with for a number of years uh, and have a great amount of trust with uh, and camaraderie with and folks that uh, knew when we were making these requests for federal assistance that we were having a really bad day. Uh, we were able to receive a federal coordinating officer, the same federal coordinating officer that I've worked with in seven of my previous federal disaster declarations. So that was helpful. He and I definitely speak the same language. Uh, we brought in the FEMA uh, incident management assistance team from region 10. They were actually on the ground here in Oregon on the 8th of September. So before we had a federal disaster declaration, FEMA uh, was leaning forward quite a bit and sent uh, some command and control resources to help us out. Uh, the FEMA USAR teams, uh, we requested those very early on to assist with remains detection. We knew we didn't have that capacity here in the state of Oregon. 
So bringing those folks in uh, was really, really helpful. And I remember our federal coordinating officer, when I made that request, said, well, Andrew, you know, that's going to be like an eight or $9 million bill, right? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so uh, what's your point? Uh, we need this capability. We don't have it in the state. Uh, and I'm not going to apologize for spending money to take care of Oregonians and, and try to bring closure to some folks. As we were getting the reports from our urban search and rescue teams, the folks that were on the ground um, searching for remains primarily, uh, they weren't finding anything. And again, just in, in the Alameda Dry Fire, I was expecting 200, 300 casualties, fatalities. Uh, I remember thinking at one point, um, if it can be less than 200 statewide, 200 fatalities, I, I will be thrilled if we have less than 200. Uh, and then I was like, wow, maybe we'll have less than 100. And at the end of the day, to only have nine fatalities associated with these fires, um, I, I don't know if it's divine intervention or what, uh, but it was pretty remarkable. Um, the USAR teams, I, I really put these guys through the paces, uh, kind of grilled them a little bit as they would send in their daily reports. Their reports would say 15 remains detected, but the number of fatalities was staying the same at six, seven, eight, or nine. So I was kind of pushing them and saying, well, you guys are detecting all of these remains. How come the fatality total isn't increasing? What these folks were finding, whoops, there's my phone. What these folks were finding uh, were cremated remains and cremation urns that people had had in their homes that burned down. Uh, I was surprised to learn that. Uh, and it gave me a great deal of confidence that if there were any remains to be found, these folks would find them. So that was a little bit of peace of mind. Uh, we brought in mass fatality support. Uh, we brought in the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, uh, to assist with the hazardous debris cleanup. Uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers also to provide assistance with debris cleanup. Uh, we established an initial operating facility with our FEMA colleagues that then transitioned to a joint field office, which is still open today and will probably be opened if I'm speaking to you a year from now. And then we brought in the burned area emergency response teams. These are the folks that explore the, uh, uh, the burned landscape, the natural environment, and make recommendations and take actions to mitigate uh, future landslides or erosion associated with wildfire and runoff. And then, of course, our overall debris management operation and our long-term housing operations. Uh, those were the two biggest priorities for us. One, cleaning up debris and getting folks uh, to some semblance of normalcy so they can begin the rebuilding process. And number two, mass care. Uh, we had thousands of folks who were displaced uh, due to these fires. Uh, at one point, we had 2,200 people uh, in shelters and another 2,200 people in hotel rooms. Uh, that was was a pretty monumental challenge for us. Uh, typically in a disaster, you open mass care congregate shelters in, in high school gymnasiums, et cetera. Because of COVID, that wasn't really an option for us. We wanted to minimize those congregate sheltering environments as much as possible. Uh, so we uh, have used and continue to use hotels to house folks. Uh, at the high point, we had 2,200 folks living in 1,100 different hotel rooms spread throughout the state. Uh, the Red Cross provided 125,000 hotel nights for Oregonians who were displaced and served almost 400,000 meals uh, to Oregonians uh, throughout these, the, the wildfire recovery piece uh, of our response. Uh, this was supported, uh, as most disasters are, by the Red Cross uh, here in Oregon. They are uh, one of the primary support organizations for our mass care operations, and they brought in 3,600 staff from across the country to assist with our operations. As we transition out of that initial mass care response, one of the things we look at is, is the transition into housing. I mentioned the folks in Southern Oregon um, the migrant seasonal farm workers, the folks that don't speak English, uh, many of them don't have documented status here in the country. That makes them ineligible for FEMA assistance. So uh, while we're leveraging the FEMA assistance as best we can to place folks, we've got about 325 eligible families who uh, are eligible for FEMA assistance but don't have insurance that we're trying to move into direct FEMA housing. Uh, we have probably three or four times that of folks uh, who are ineligible for FEMA assistance due to their documentation status or lack of documentation. 
that causes problems uh, for both interacting with those folks. They're they're uh, concerned about interacting with the government. Uh, they don't want to share information. Uh, and it presents some challenges for us to reach out to them uh, and see what services we can provide as a state. Uh, Andrew? Yeah. Uh, just wanted to see, we're coming up on the 15 minute remaining Perfect. mark. So I just want to make sure we leave some time for Q&A, although I think you're answering a lot of questions as we go through here. Absolutely. I've got a couple of slides left. I want to talk real quickly about the communications piece. Um, all emergencies, I think, are public information emergencies. Uh, that's been a lesson that, that I've observed over and over again. Uh, you need to be able to speak honestly and openly with not just the community and the folks that have been impacted, um, but bounce back and forth between how you message what's happening and give direction to your team, your staff, your partners, your elected officials, your leadership, in my case, the governor, uh, legislators, but then how you're, you're conveying a level of calm and, and conveying what the organization is doing to the community, uh, trying to, to ease some of that anxiety that your community is feeling after a disaster like this. Uh, trust becomes really important. Um, one of the challenges that we had uh, with messaging uh, was the number of folks that were under evacuation notices. I, I believe we had mentioned in a press release, 500,000 people had been evacuated. Uh, the next morning I found myself in a press conference with the governor explaining, well, no, we misspoke. 500,000 folks were not evacuated. 500,000 people were under evacuation notices. It's subtle, it's nuanced, it's a little semantic, um, but those are things that uh, when you slip up, if you if you miscommunicate something, you need to uh, find a way to uh, correct that message and be honest uh, and open, and uh, admit when uh, when when you need to say something differently uh, and and own it. That was a big lesson for us. Um, as we continue to transition to recovery, this is a billion dollar disaster. Uh, and that's just the stuff that, that we're able to document to work with FEMA on reimbursement for. Uh, we've received over 25,000 applications for individual assistance. $30 million so far has already been distributed. Uh, and I mentioned our, our biggest uh, mission right now uh, are to clear the 4,500 home sites uh, that have been damaged or destroyed to get Oregonians back uh, into some level of permanent housing and start the rebuilding process. The image you see on your screen here, this is the first person to be licensed into their FEMA provided housing. You see the travel trailer behind that person. Uh, this was last week, um, uh, just after Thanksgiving on, on uh, Friday, the Friday after Thanksgiving. Uh, we've got another 325 families that we want to be able to put into housing. Long way to go, uh, but we're proud to say that we are making progress. And finally, I'll close just by noting uh, that um, it's important you fight the dragon that's in front of you, but we also need to keep an eye towards the horizon. Uh, if we get too bogged down with with that, that thing, whatever it is that's right in front of us, we, we lose some of that strategic vision that we need to really make sure uh, we're taking care of our people, uh, of our community, uh, and, and positioning ourselves for successful recovery. This is a big deal, a big disaster. My concern is that 2020 isn't an anomaly, isn't an anomaly it's an indicator of what's to come. Uh, and we're going to be dealing with the recovery of this for a long time. Our, our previous big disaster in Oregon was in 2007, some flooding that we had, a $50 million disaster. This is uh, many times a larger disaster than that flood. Uh, and that flood just closed the recovery process uh, with FEMA in 2019, 12 years. So a lot of work ahead of us. These are some glamour shots. This is from our ECC parking lot uh, the morning after the fire started. Oh, look, llamas from our animal shelter and evacuations. So the, the critters that people evacuated with uh, to the state fairgrounds was uh, incredible and, and brought uh, some smiles uh, to the faces of those who were also evacuated. Of course, uh, you can't be uh, in a disaster unless you're taking a helicopter ride with the governor. Uh, and disasters get political real quick. Uh, we had both of our U.S. Senators, uh, Congressman DeFazio, who's the chair of the Transportation Committee at the House, who oversees FEMA, the FEMA Administrator, all of these folks uh, coming to visit and, and try to be helpful. Uh, you can't neglect that aspect of the work that we do. And then finally, uh, a fire engine from Adana, Oregon, uh, that was lost to the flames in the Beachy Creek Fire. I know we've got a lot of fire folks here uh, on the call, so I wanted to show that and uh, get a little bit of sympathy from you all. 
that's all I've got. Uh, and uh, boy, a whole lot of information. Um, it, it's been a heck of a, a couple of months, a heck of a year. Um, and I just appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all today. And hopefully I have some time to answer some questions here. Well, Andrew, that was that was fantastic. Uh, I think for a while I sent out a call for questions and I think people were just stunned uh, taking in all the information. Uh, and there's certainly a lot of questions here. So uh, please uh, send your questions in via chat if you have them. Uh, and then Andrew, if you want to uh, pull your uh, video camera up so we can see you. Sure. Uh, and uh, there we are. Okay. So um, these are questions that came in and we've got a lot here. Obviously, we're not going to be able to get through all of them. Um, but uh, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, evacuation? I know you say that this is primarily a locally owned uh, and it falls down to the sheriff. Now, I've done a little looking in, in California after the, the campfire in the Butte County and, and all that. And, um, you know, and that's a challenge, right? Because you have all these overlap, well, not overlapping, we have all these small, smallish jurisdictions. Uh, and so maybe walk through uh, how those decisions about level one, level two get made and the role of the of the state office versus the local sheriff's or emergency managers? Yeah, so uh, generally it's that conversation at the local level where the sheriff's office or the local emergency manager is talking to the fire, uh, the fire teams, the incident management teams for the fires. They're looking at weather patterns, uh, where the fire is likely to burn, where they can set up uh, containment lines uh, to be successful, and those all impact uh, evacuation notices. Again, having that tiered level one, level two, level three evacuation system has really uh, taken root here in Oregon, and folks uh, and the media understand what that means. So when they hear level one, they understand, okay, not quite time to panic yet, but I need to make sure I've got my act together. Uh, it's really uh, comes down to life safety. Uh, if we feel, if our counties feel, if the fire teams feel uh, that homes and individuals are in jeopardy, we're going to make the decision to evacuate. Uh, it's never an easy decision to make. Uh, you get folks that don't want to evacuate, that maybe evacuated two summers ago and nothing bad happened, so they're skeptical of the need to evacuate. Those are all challenges for us to overcome with our messaging. Um, but again, I think if you look at this fire, uh, storm that we had uh, and the relatively low number of casualties, nine fatalities, um, that tells me that the way we're messaging things in Oregon, the way we have our tiered evacuation system set up and the work that folks do to get messages out to, to their communities, um, it, it seems to be working. Uh, we, we used high-tech solutions like our mass notification systems, low-tech solutions uh, like uh, Twitter and, and posting notices that way, and no-tech solutions. It, talking to a lot of the survivors, they evacuated because they smelled smoke, they saw flames, or they got a knock on their door from a neighbor saying, hey, you got to get out of here. The fire's coming. Okay. Uh, and so just to reiterate that, Andrew, so a level one means something in Lincoln City, the same thing in Salem, the same thing in the Dells. Uh, so that's a statewide protocol. Yeah, it, it, it is. Um, uh, it's something that the last four or five years, uh, we, we've, we've spent a lot of time messaging that, um, putting public information out. We, we shared on social media. And, and for the most part, folks seem to get it. Uh, it was kind of nice. My wife, when she called and said, hey, we're under level one notification. So I'm going to make sure that, you know, all of our important papers are in our go bag and ready to go in case we need to leave. I'm like, yeah, all right. Uh <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, we've got a, a, quite a few here, so we'll just uh, sure. kind of go rapid fire. No pun intended. And, and um, noon isn't a hard stop for me, by the way. If you guys want to keep yeah. talking, I, I'm well, fine. I think I, I I I don't know how to extend a Zoom call. Right. And we we'll put that in there, so I think it's out of our hands at this maybe, point. Maybe we'll keep talking until they shut us down. That's right. Uh, well, nine minutes. So, is there a centralized sheltering plan at the state level, or is that uh, managed at the local level? That's also managed at the local level to a degree. Um, we do have a, an ESF-6 mass care, emergency support function 6 mass care uh, run through the Oregon Department of Human Services, uh, co-led by the American Red Cross. Uh, because we were coming into this COVID posture where we knew we were going to rely on non-congregant sheltering or hotel rooms, we did a little bit more planning this year than we typically do. Uh, some of our fires earlier in the season, we were able to evacuate 20, 30 homes and kind of test drive what it looks like to shelter folks in hotels and motels. Uh, uh, but really the evacuation and sheltering plan happens locally until the local folks become overwhelmed. Then the state comes in and augments and is a force multiplier for that response. Um, but ultimately we want to ensure a level of local control for those plans. Okay, great. Uh, 
and I apologize for going uh, rapid yeah, fire here. Keep but going. The next Love one, uh, and, and to just to bring in COVID, uh, I know that there were occupancy restrictions, were there not, in hotels um, at the time of the fire, and so did that, you know, uh, have a have an impact on your on your sheltering plans. It really didn't. Um, again, the Red Cross had done tremendous work working with hotels uh, in advance of the fire. Uh, there was a lot of things happening on the fly, but I don't know that we had, uh, due to COVID restrictions, any issues with getting people into hotels and motels. We've got a number of hotels that communities have designated as uh, non congregate shelters for those that have been discharged from the hospital for COVID but aren't quite ready to return home, uh, or for homeless populations that need a safe place to stay while they recover from COVID. Uh, but that really didn't didn't uh, factor into our operations for sheltering, or, or we didn't have any major hiccups uh, due to COVID uh, restrictions. Okay. Um, I know Oregon's not afraid to regulate land use. I, I, I don't see it. I think you still have the, the urban growth boundaries there mm -hmm. around Portland, uh, which is really quite striking. If you ever go to Portland and you start driving, yep. all of a sudden you go from Portland to, you know, farmland. Woods. Yep. And, uh, uh, but, you know, what are the prospects, I guess, for, uh, you know, uh, state regulation or greater regulation around, uh, you know, defensible space, potentially uh, restricting development in some of these at-risk areas. Yeah, so it's so much of it is, is like I said, how we build and where we build. Um, it's going to take a lot of political will and political capital to get those types of changes uh, uniformly made uh, across the state. One of my biggest concerns isn't even so much the uh, um, wild and urban interface issues. It's a lot of the homes that were destroyed in the Alameda fire were low income housing built in floodplains back in the 50s and 60s, mobile mm -hmm. home parks built in floodplains. We need affordable housing. We need places for people to live. But geez louise, can we please not put them back in a floodplain uh, where we're just kicking the can to, to another disaster down the road? Um, we, we it, It's incumbent on us to rebuild the right way uh, and, and to think uh, a little bit more about risk reduction in how we build. OK. Uh, and then you, you talked a little bit about rumor control and public information. Uh, you know, there was this this issue in the uh, town of, uh, I guess, Corbett on the way out to Multnomah Falls there from Portland, where I guess there was a rumor going around in the in the uh, social media about uh, Antifa yep. uh, intentionally setting fires. And then there was this episode, I guess, where a group of uh, armed locals decided they were going to set up a roadblock and, and interrogate anybody who was driving into the community. Do you want to touch that? Do you have a 10-foot pole handy? Yeah, yeah absolutely. No, okay. I, I was wondering, actually, uh, when I when I first moved here, if, if maybe that's where Glenn's family came from. <laughs> well, they are troublemakers, apparently. <laughs> apparently. Uh, you know, uh, that's that's kind of Oregon. Uh, you know, the fact that there was a fire burning, I guess, isn't uh, makes it a little bit more unique. Uh, but the rumors of Antifa starting the fires, those were debunked pretty quickly. You know, we had some of the more conservative sheriffs in the state of Oregon uh, come out really quickly on social media and say, there's no truth to those rumors at all that Antifa's out in the woods starting these fires. Uh, and I feel like we were able to get our arms wrapped around those rumors pretty quickly. Uh, similarly, the folks that wanted to uh, protect their property and, and stand at their driveway with the loaded 12 gauge, um, law enforcement dealt with it, I think, pretty handily. Uh, a lot of those things were overblown, I think, uh, by media, by the rumor mill. Um, we didn't have any issues of anyone uh, being injured by folks trying to protect their property or trespassers, but we did have a couple of arrests where folks uh, were watching their property or their neighbor's property that had been evacuated and called law enforcement and said, hey, there's a car are parked in a driveway here that didn't belong here and, and those folks were uh, were taken into custody so um you know disasters bring the rumor mill uh and and it becomes almost a secondary disaster for us as emergency managers and public information folks to to dispel some of those rumors um but one thing looking at the, the election coverage in particular and the work that CISA did on their rumor control webpage and their ability to quickly identify and correct rumors, that's a lesson all of us can learn uh, about how to, to combat not just misinformation, uh, but the more nefarious disinformation. Okay. Uh, kind of going, we're jumping around now. The, uh, in terms of getting mutual aid resources, uh, you know, firefighting resources in particular, although I imagine you had law enforcement coming in as well. Uh, with all the ongoing, you know, with the active incidents around you in Washington and uh, California, which I assume are your go-to places, they're both proficient in wildland yeah. firefighting. At any point, did they just say, "Hey, sorry, you know, we're done. We got nothing to, to send to you." Look to <laughs> pretty, Idaho or pretty, something. Pretty quickly, they said that. Um, okay. 
I will say that, uh, again, the relationships that we have, uh, my, my good friend and counterpart in California, Mark Gilarducci, my good friend and counterpart in Utah, uh, Chris Hamlet. Uh, Chris had already committed to sending from Utah several strike forces to California for wildfire fighting. Uh, I got a call from Mark Gilarducci in California a day or two after the fire saying, hey, we've got six task forces from Utah coming. Is that okay if I send three of them up to Oregon? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yes, that's okay. Uh, so, so we got an extra 15 engines, uh, you know, just, just because of the relationships that we have and, and Mark in California knew he could call me, I could call Chris and, and, and we could work that out in about 20 minutes to redirect these resources. Okay. Um, what would you say are the, is the top or top three kind of takeaways and kind of words of advice, I guess, to aspiring or current emergency managers out there? Um, uh, well, my, my, my big takeaway always is, is that public information piece. You need to make sure that uh, you're providing the public, your, your community with timely accurate information to allow them to make decisions to protect themselves. Uh, you also need to take care of your people. Um, if, if they're struggling, you got to know when to give them a break. Uh, no one needs to be a hero uh, and, and work themselves to a point where they're not useful. Um, and make decisions to commit resources as early as you possibly can. If you're gonna wait for 100% of the information that you think you need to make a decision, you've waited too long. Uh, emergency managers need to be comfortable with making decisions with about 20 or 30% of the information that they would like to have to make those decisions uh, and, and be prepared to live with the consequences. Again, I, bringing in millions of dollars in mass fatality resources, do we need them? Nope. Do I need to apologize for doing it? Nope, not gonna. <laughs> Okay, I think that's our last word. Um, as we as we tick toward three o'clock here, just keep in mind. Uh, thank you, Andrew, again for your time. That was a fantastic presentation. We are going to put this up in, on a stream. It will be up on the website, and we will send an email out to the group when it is available, which hopefully won't be too long. Um, and so, thank you all for attending. This was a, a great event, and and, and once again, uh, thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Okay.